the internal management perspective at Morgan Stanley on open source also started to change in two very important ways. So, like I said, the support, community support model was proving to work pretty well. We were happy with the results. Um, we were also coming to the realization that the commercial support model sometimes didn't work at all. And that you, you could not generalize and say, well, open source community support, not good. Commercial support, wonderful, we'll pay millions for it. You really have to evaluate the quality of the code, quality of the product, and the quality of the support on a case-by-case -case basis. There are some commercial vendors, when you call the 800 number, you know that commercial where the guy says, oh, we're out of decaf, and, and the, the next, it's the next tell ad where the, uh, the pit crew jumps over the wall and refills out of the coffee machine? There are some firms that respond like that. They're great. I haven't had the experience of working with them personally, unfortunately. But there are some people that do very good commercial support. The other end of the spectrum is also there. There are some companies that literally you call up to get support and the people on the other end of the phone can't spell the name of the product. Um, I better not say who it is or I'll get fired, but their name is in the front of this pony. <clears throat> now I'm in trouble. Okay, wait, wait, not, I better qualify that so I keep my job. No, I better not, I'm just gonna shut up before I'm still, boy, so I can put the Morgan Stanley badge back on. Um, the, the other change is really far more significant in that we've been for years been contributing patches somewhat subversely, or not subversely, covertly, um, back to the open source communities. But releasing software that we developed um, that was written from scratch at Morgan Stanley as open source was a pretty alien concept. And I'd been trying for years to do this. In 1998, I made a fateful decision, which I still think was the dumbest thing I did in my career, to manage the IBM MQ series product. Ooh, I said it. Sure. Um, I took over ownership of their MQ Series Pro module, which they didn't really care about. It was put out on their website as a support pack, and it was pretty minimal. Um, didn't work all that well. And since we were trying to build an infrastructure for managing MQ Series, naturally, we wanted to write it all in Perl. And that module grew from a few hundred lines to several tens of thousands. Um, we've added a huge set of object-oriented classes that wrap around their um, C API. Um, it's, it's a very, very powerful Perl module for that product. But then IBM said, well, we're sick of re-releasing your code. You do it. Well, now I have myself in a bind, okay? Rather than just giving my code changes back to IBM for them to release on their website, they wouldn't do that anymore. Um, I had to be able to release it internally. Um, okay, if this wasn't a 30 minute talk, I'd go through the debates I had with our legal department, which was a section of the firm I had never set foot in before, and hope never to set foot in again. But by the end of 1999, I had convinced them that we could release open source software um, under Gary Wall's artistic license. And since then, they've gone to saying, ah, what the hell, just do it under the GPL, we don't care. Now, it's important to note, though, that the, there's an important caveat here. The caveat being that the software we release cannot give us a direct competitive advantage in our primary business. As a result, you probably won't see us releasing an awful lot of you know, uh, financial services software as open source. Um, I'd love to be proven wrong, but I don't see that happening. You will see and have seen already, we've released a fair amount of software that we use for developing our infrastructure not necessarily the end user tools that the, the traders use, um, as open source. Um, the key there is that our corporate IT culture had evolved not only to accepting open source software as a, something to use to build this enterprise, but also as something we can give back. Um, again, provided that you know, Merrill Lynch couldn't take it and make billions of dollars more than we do. <clears throat> and I think that was pretty significant. So where are we going in the 21st century? This is that fourth period. What I'm really most excited about is not what we've done with open source, um, but what we're going to be doing it in the future. The 90s saw it evolve into the key component of infrastructure, saw structured release software as open source. Um, I think the future is pretty bright. We're looking at moving from commercial solutions to open source solutions for a lot of our infrastructure. Now, so that I really don't get in trouble, a lot of the things I'm about to say are not official corporate positions. They're my take on where I see our own internal decision making process going and certainly where all the geeks that control those processes or influence them tend to agree. I think we're going to see Apache emerge as our primary uh, web server infrastructure over the next few years. Um, we're going to be replacing the commercial Kerberos infrastructure we paid millions for um, with something that we compile based on the open source implementation, and the reason primarily being because the support from the vendor has been abominable. They refuse to port it to Linux. They want us to pay millions for that. Um, they have not fixed most of the budget reporting. This has been a, a problem with a lot of the commercial software we had. You know, once we scale it up and we start using it in ways the vendor didn't anticipate, then we don't get bug fixes. They go, oh, that's an enhancement. Oh, you want it to scale? Wow, well, that's a different problem. And suddenly we're being squeezed for cash. The open source community, well, we're empowered to make the changes we need to make this stuff scale. 
Um, we're going to be moving from the IBM AFS product to the open AFS product over the next few years. Um, I also think that Linux is going to be key, and here's why. Now, this is one that could really get me in trouble. Again, I've got to be careful. But fortunately, my boss is not at this conference, so I'm probably okay. The, the reason we're looking at going to Linux is not because we've argued that Linux is the strategic solution, even though a lot of us fanatically believe that and pound the table and go, yes, we should go Linux. It's based on the commodity hardware argument. I mean, if you look at the price performance of Sun running Solaris, which is today our primary production installation, or excuse me, most of our um, production Unix does run on, on Sun hardware today. Um, but if you price perform the Sun running Solaris against some of the newer Intel hardware running Linux, then it, the Intel stuff wins, hands down. Um, so when you, if you make this commodity hardware argument that we should be getting into you know, um, a much more a competitive commodity hardware platform, then you have to ask the question, well, what operating system do you want? Now, this is funny, because this is where the NT guys go, yes, we won, and they're dead wrong. <clears throat> <laughs> All right, you have two choices. 